Now for more on the Paris climate deal and what's happened in the past year, I'm joined by Paul Bledsoe, president of Bledsoe and Associates. Welcome back to the show. Nice to see you again. So a lot of people are wondering, we're at this one year anniversary since the COP21. What's some of the concrete progress we've seen since then? There's actually been remarkable burgeoning of clean energy growth around the world. More than half of the new electricity capacity in the last 12 months has been renewable energy, wind and solar. Um, China alone puts up two new windmills every hour, 24 hours a day, around the clock. We have 500,000 solar panels going up every day around the world. It's an incredible boom. The truth is, though, we have to do some more. Um, one of the things that a lot of us are worried about is that we're not making big enough efforts to manage carbon, its complete cycle, including things like forests and agriculture, effects on the oceans. So they, while we're making progress, there's much more that needs to be done. Now, one thing that could throw a wrench in that is potentially having the U.S. withdrawing um, from the Paris uh, Agreement. And obviously, the U.S. is one of the world's biggest carbon emitters. So what does that mean in terms of the confidence that's instilled in the accord? And, and could we perhaps expect other countries to follow the U.S.'s line? No, I don't believe any other country is going to withdraw from the Paris Agreement. I was at Marrakesh uh, in Morocco, and every single world leader pledged that they were going to be in the Paris Agreement with or without the U.S. I also think it's an open question whether Donald Trump will formally withdraw from the Paris Agreement. You know, his chief diplomatic nominee, Rex Tillerson, CEO of Exxon, supports the Paris Agreement, believes in climate science. And so I believe that there's a very good chance that the Trump administration will not, in fact, withdraw from the Paris Agreement. You know, the president-elect himself has said, he said many things on the campaign trail that he right. may not actually do in office. I really hope that's one of them. And to be fair, he has said he's going to be keeping an open mind. And obviously, one of his selling points was this whole idea of jobs. How are businesses and communities who rely on fossil fuels, as well as some of the ones in these greener industries, how overall have they been reacting to this accord? Well, I think there's some misunderstanding about what the agreement does and doesn't do. The truth is that no electric uh, utility CEO in the United States is going to go out and build a coal-fired power plant on January 20th because Donald Trump is sworn into office. That's not the way it works. They know that carbon constraints are inevitable. Where we're seeing job growth is in clean energy, and that's what we have to do. We have to figure out a way to move people away from extractive industries into jobs in clean energy. Now, there are ways to use natural gas and coal safely in the electric electricity sector, including carbon capture and storage. There's a very good chance that the Trump administration, Republicans in Congress will pass new incentives for the building of carbon capture and storage. There are also other technologies they may innovate, including advanced nuclear technology and, as I said, the use of forest and farmlands to sequester carbon. There are new technologies Republicans can get behind, but they have to admit the basic science of climate change to get there. A lot of these efforts right. are, are consonant with Trump's broader economic agenda. Now, Paul, I want to broaden it out um, to the global community. Obviously, we see things like earthquakes, flooding, increasingly volatile weather patterns. And it does tend to be some of these more sensitive countries, countries like Haiti, which really bear the brunt of it. As we look at the sort of impact we're seeing on, on GDP for some of these countries, what could we be looking at in terms of the damage? We just got a report from uh, in the bulletin of the American Meteorological Society last week done by the UK Med Office and the US NOAA Office finding that climate change is causing increasing extreme weather events all around the world. The devastating floods in China last year were made more, much more likely because of climate change. The Australian heat wave, the incredible wildfires in Alaska of all places that raged for six months last year, right. all these events are happening more often because of climate change. We're unsure yet about total economic costs, but I'll give you one example in the U.S. There was extreme weather again, uh, flooding in Louisiana in, uh, um, I think it was in October of this year, that uh, damaged 100,000 homes, just that one flooding event. 
That was made twice as likely because of climate change and cost $5 billion alone. So that shows that these are huge economic stakes involved. Right. And I think we have to get that balance sheet right where we balance the cost of reducing emissions against the cost of not reducing them. And I think we're going to find that the impacts around the world on our economic infrastructure, on productivity, on, on, on people being able to work right. in extreme heat, are going to be more expensive than if we don't act. Well, certainly hope people take heed to that. Thank you so much. We'll have to leave it there. Paul Bledsoe, president of Bledsoe & Associates. Always a pleasure.